thank you. Uh, great. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, uh, after the break. Um, <clears throat> Um, I'll just start with uh, an introduction and um, acknowledgement, perhaps. I just want to uh, say that I wouldn't be here uh, talking to you about uh, linear mixed effects models if it hadn't been for um, David um, Orego Carmona and Jan Louis Kruger, uh, particularly David, who organized this conference in Birmingham a couple of years ago, and they convinced me uh, that linear uh, mixed models. Um, is the only way to go. So I understand now why we need to use uh, linear mixed models, uh, although I have to make another confession that I don't quite yet understand uh, the mixed models themselves uh, fully. Um, so um, what is going to um, happen today is I'll uh, give a brief introduction. Um, I'll give you some context so that you know uh, where we are coming from and uh, where we're heading. And the main part of the talk will be Brenna. Brenna um, will uh, first introduce uh, mixed models uh, in slides and then um, the bulk of the talk today will be him going over um, a set of sample data that we have prepared for you. Brenna just shared this data in the chat. That's um, an SPSS file. So those of you who have SPSS, you can open and uh, you know uh, follow um, this with Brenna. Um, I know you can also open this in R. So if you want to play with it later, perhaps that's also um, an option. Um, okay, so uh, let me just uh, go ahead and um, <clears throat> uh, tell you. So our uh, presentation today uh, has three parts, as, as I said. Uh, first, uh, just a little bit of introduction on previous eye tracking research on subtitling, then uh, theoretical introduction on uh, linear mixed effects models, and then we'll walk you through a step by step um, on how to uh, do uh, an LMM uh, analysis uh, in SPSS uh, based on the data set that I will um, um, explain a little bit. Okay, so uh, I think Jan Louis uh, made an excellent, um, gave an excellent introduction to the eye tracking research on subtitling. Um, but I wanted to have a, a quick overview of uh, what has been done and what uh, could be done better. So the earliest eye tracking study on subtitling, uh, interlingual subtitling that I have read is uh, the one by um, um, Willard uh, and colleagues uh, dating from 1983. And this is the uh, kind of uh, eye tracker they uh, used. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, very ambitious, um, uh, I think, enterprise uh, doing this in the early uh, 80s. And uh, they set themselves um, about the quality of data that they had. Um, and I have a quote here that such data are not easily worked nor are they readily and accurately capable of relating to the object seen so that one may say with confidence where a subject is looking. <laughs> so they're basically undermining uh, the, the whole idea. OK, so they did this eye tracking study, but they were not sure, you know, um, they couldn't say with confidence where people are looking. And that's the whole point. OK, but um, they were pioneers and uh, well done for this. Those of you who are interested in eye tracking studies on subtitling, uh, you're familiar with probably the most uh, famous person who has uh, worked on this, Professor uh, Di Deval, um, a psychologist from the University of uh, Leuven. So he started, as you can see, it's not, of course, a full list of publications, uh, his publications on subtitling and tracking and eye tracking. He started in the early 80s and he continued um, well and after that. And um, Thanks to him, uh, we know that uh, the reading of subtitles is largely uh, automated in the sense that you see a subtitle, there's a movement and you look there, you can't really stop this, at least most people uh, can't. So, um, and he devoted a lot of attention um, to studying visual attention and uh, many different characteristics, characteristics of subtitles on the one hand, something that Jan Louis mentioned. So the speed of subtitles, the language of the audio, the language of the subtitles, how many lines, the layout text segmentation, but also a subtitle reading, it was found, it depends on uh, viewer characteristics, right? So how old they are, whether they're familiar with subtitles, whether they're proficient in the language, whether they're good readers, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. 
Now, uh, if you think about the equipment that was used by Professor de Deval and uh, his colleagues in uh, the 1890s, that was the, <laughs> uh, the, this, this uh, model of the computer uh, that, they, uh, that they used. So I think we've moved on. Um, and uh, the, uh, when you think about the TV sets in the 1980s that they, uh, that they used, so this was more or less uh, the kind of uh, equipment that we are talking about, okay? Uh, surprisingly enough, we still rely on these studies a lot, and we uh, tend to uh, cite them um, sometimes even as um, uh, the Bible. I wasn't able to find a picture of the eye tracker that they uh, used, but I have a <laughs> model here in the slides. Uh, it was... Um, <clears throat> Um, um, it was using a corneal reflection uh, method, a sampling rate of 50 uh, hertz, and it was like a head tracking um, system, and they had participants sitting in front of the uh, TV screen about approximately three meters away, and you think about the distance and the, um, how the uh, TV looked like. So today uh, we've got much better equipment. You can do uh, lots of things with video-based eye trackers. Some people even study reading uh, with um, glasses. So we have uh, moved on uh, with hardware, but we also have moved on with um, analytical methods and, and the precision uh, in which we can uh, measure the study of reading. So uh, what did it used to look like? Uh, so uh, what did we do before? It was, it's not only me, uh, it's um, um, a number of people who worked on uh, subtitling. What did we do before? We would draw areas of interest on particular um, subtitles uh, with frame um, accuracy. So that was done manually uh, on each uh, subtitle. And then we compiled uh, the data. This was using the SMI uh, system. Uh, we did it, Jan Louis did it as well before. Uh, when you wanted to have um, word um, accuracy, you had to draw areas of interest uh, manually, uh, right? Because subtitles were burned into the images and that took a lot of pain and a lot of time and required a lot of students work. And I did that myself too. Some people uh, were clever enough uh, or not and used this uh, threshold line. So they had uh, set in pixels uh, a line and whatever was below, they said, okay, this is this fixation is on a subtitle. And if, uh, if there was above um, <clears throat> the threshold line, that's the image. So as you can see, it uh, wasn't really um, precise enough. And we couldn't, as I said, uh, use those automatic areas of interest because subtitles are burnt into the image. So we just had to draw everything manually. We had this study with ESA that took a lot of time. Now, what can be done now and what Yanoi uh, has uh, done and what we are going to do in our new project is we're going to use iLink and uh, thanks to um, iLink team and some Python based scripts, we'll be able to get um, data for every word uh, without having to draw manually um, anything. So we'll have data on uh, subtitles as well as on every word in the subtitle. All right then, so that's the context in which we are um, operating. So you can see uh, the progress that we have um, made. And before I uh, give floor to Breno, I wanted to introduce uh, the sample data that we'll um, be using um, to explain uh, mixed effects models, uh, and then that we'll be using to um, do some analysis um, in SPSS. So this was the um, an experiment that some of you may have heard about. Um, it was part of the short project that I was uh, conducting uh, in London with uh, Olivia Herbert Moron, who's uh, here. We used the SMI Red uh, 250 mobile eye tracker that was at University College uh, London. And the original experiment was um, a bit more complex. So we used two by three mixed factorial design. So the within subject variable was subtitling speed in this particular experiment. So we had slow subtitles displayed at 12 characters per second and fast subtitles displayed at 20. And they were this consistently uh, subtitled at those speeds. There was not much variability. And we also had a between subject variable. We tested people uh, whose um, mother tongues were different. So we had Polish, Spanish, and English uh, native uh, speakers uh, for this. And originally in the publications in uh, what uh, I originally did, we just used um, mixed ANOVA analysis. Uh, in today's experiment, we are 
simplifying a little bit. So we're just using data for Polish participants. Uh, so as you can see, the between a subject factor is um, gone. So we're just using the repeated measures design uh, with um, one independent variable subtitling speed. So we have slow subtitles and fast. Uh, subtitles here and our dependent variable here is what we call proportional reading time PRT so I'll just take one slide to explain this to those of you who may not be familiar with this so essentially uh, PRT uh, is calculated as the percentage of dwell time that um, persons spend in an area of interest area of interest being one subtitle as a function of how long this subtitle was displayed so for instance, if you had a subtitle that was displayed for four seconds, which is like 4,000 milliseconds, right? And participants spend two seconds um, reading the subtitle and two seconds looking somewhere else. So proportional reading time here would be 50%, right? So, and that means that while this subtitle was displayed for four seconds, the person was just looking at this subtitle for half of the time. 50% of the time. And what we wanted to do is compare the, the, this proportion of time spent in the subtitles um, when they were uh, slow and when they were fast. And the idea behind all this is that when PRT is higher, when it approaches 100%, that would mean that participants spend most of their time looking, reading, at the, uh, reading the subtitles, uh, looking at the subtitles, but they don't have time to a look at the on-screen action and some people believe that the higher the speed the higher the uh, prt so that's the context we use two videos uh one from uh, grace and frankie the other from girl girl, girl. so we had um, up to from two to four uh, speakers uh, we controlled or tried to control for several different aspects of this so um, these clips were fast paced dialogue heavy uh, we checked the readability scores of subtitles um, uh, on a number of different indices and they were quite similar so we felt okay this is this is good we're safe here and we used uh counterbalancing um so when let's say the first participant uh, was watching grace and frankie at uh, with slow subtitles and then gilmoga is with the fast one and then the other participant the other way around right so we had this counterbalanced um uh, latin square based design and uh some of you uh, um, are wondering how many participants I should use uh, in my study. Uh, Andrew Duhovsky said 10 yesterday. We tend to say, oh, well, 20, 30, 40, you know, um, 20 per condition perhaps, but that's not only, that's the question, uh, not necessarily how many participants, but how many data points you're going to have, right? That's uh, going back to this um, uh, discussion uh, yesterday. So um, for another analysis, you remember we had like one, um row per participant uh, per condition but here for uh, linear mixed effects models that Brenna is going to explain we had uh, more data so we took uh, the data um our row of data was um one uh, subtitle and i have a, a screenshot uh, of this um soon just to uh, say um Mm, very briefly what um, the data selection procedure was. So um, the tracking ratio uh, we accepted was uh, anything above 80%. And we only analyzed subtitles which were actually looked at, right? So we didn't analyze subtitles that were skipped. And the, the threshold for fixation duration uh, was uh, between 80 and 500 milliseconds. And of course, it's a bit arbitrary, but still. So. Um, uh, traditionally, as I said, people would uh, use either a t-test or some um, non-parametric equivalents of this or ANOVAs to analyze this, myself included, I'm guilty of this as well. So this is what, um, what we did when you conduct a t-test or an ANOVA analysis, you have one row uh, per participant, right? That's within subject design. So we have two columns, one um, uh, for the slow subtitling speed, the other for the fast subtitling speed. But what you're essentially doing is uh, you're collating uh, the data from uh, every subtitle to one single value. And this is what is known as the, the wide uh, format, right? So you haven't got data for different words, you haven't got data for different subtitles, you're just providing one value. And so that's a lot of averaging going on here. Um, 
Therefore, uh, we've got lots of issues. So there's, uh, first of all, there's this lack of granularity. Okay, so you can just have some general conclusions, but you can't really look into the differences between particular subtitles or words. You can't account for individual differences between participants and subtitles, et cetera, et cetera. Brenner's going to go into detail. So unlike in another uh, analysis, um, what we have um, in, uh, in LMMs uh, and in R, as was mentioned <laughs> yesterday, we have this, uh, what, what is known as the, the long format, right? So you can see we have several data rows uh, from one participant per one area of interest actually, right? So this is what you can see uh, here. So we have data um, from different clips, different uh, speeds. Um, yes, yeah, so this is what the data uh, looks like. Um, and uh, thanks to using uh, linear mixed effects models, we can um, analyze uh, our subtitle reading patterns and look into um, more details, such as the number of words, uh, characters per subtitle, the, the duration of the subtitle, whether there was a difference um, in the case of uh, subtitles that had one or uh, two lines. Also, uh, all those things that we just mentioned after in the chat after Jan Louise's uh, talk, all those other aspects that um, impact on the uh, reading, such as word frequency, length, concreteness, part of speech, etc. Okay, and uh, we're not the first ones, uh, right? Uh, some people have actually used uh, LMMs uh, before, um, and uh, probably it's not a full list. Uh, you'll have the slides available to you, so you don't need to note that down. I'm just saying uh, we're just going to go that way uh, with our uh, further studies. And uh, Brenna, over to you. So I'll stop sharing. Okay, and I'll share. Okay. What is this thing? Okay, hi everyone. So, uh, as has been mentioned a few times before, actually, uh, linear mixed models are advanced models. Okay, so what I'll try to do here is cover the very, very, very basics. And I will also, uh, in the slides here, I will provide a I, I will provide a list of, uh, let's say, introductory readings and a list of um, uh, like not so introductory readings. You will have access to the slides. So uh, the references, they are they, they have short comments and what you can find there. So, you know, you will be able to follow up later. OK, Brenna, uh, we can't see you. Is that the way you want it? Uh, no, it's not. I thought my camera was on from the very beginning. So give me a second. No, I think it's off by default can, when you join. Can you, can you see me now? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, the analysis, uh, I think that uh, researchers work with linear mixed models. Uh, they tend to use R or R Studio because the truth is it is more powerful. Okay. You can do pretty much everything you can do in SPSS and more. But SPSS is rather powerful. You have uh, most of the, of the functions that you need um, and the results are rather reliable. So it wouldn't be a problem to conduct a study in SPSS and get it published in good journals, okay? But R is more powerful, uh, especially when it comes to data visualization because the graphs in SPSS do not look good. Um, but uh, the learning curve with R is a lot steeper than with SPSS, right? So this, this would probably help those people who are already familiar with, with SPSS, and at least for now, do not have the time or the willingness to learn R, okay? So uh, mixed models are called mixed because they have fixed and random effects, okay? Think of ANOVAs, linear regressions. Think about the more traditional statistical approaches as fixed effect models only, okay? So basically what the mixed model does is add random effects. So what is a fixed effect? Uh, variables you would add in a regression or ANOVA, uh, they are the variables that will be there either to answer your research question or the variables that will be there, for example, covariates to control for certain variance in the data. 
Yes, some examples, uh, like in our study, we would have a factor with two levels, right? Speed, subtitles at 12 and 20 CPS. Uh, this is not in the study, but it was in the original. We could have a factor, another factor with three levels, like the language, uh, Polish subtitles with no audio, English audio, Polish audio, uh, for instance. Yes, you could have covariates, uh, the subtitle levels, so number of words, characters per subtitle, duration of subtitle. You could have covariates at the word level, part of speech, frequency, length. Obviously, if you measured, if your area of interest was the whole subtitle, then uh, you cannot you cannot take the part of speech, the frequency, the length, the concreteness of each individual word. But perhaps what we, you could do is say you could calculate the frequency of all the words in that subtitle, and you could average that frequency. Yes, and you could use that. Uh, obviously, it is better to be able to calculate per word. Yes, and here we calculate it per subtitle. But if you are able to calculate per word, then you will have uh, the frequency of each word, the length of each word, the, the lexicalization of each word, many, many variables you can use that will definitely uh, allow you to explain more variance in your calculation, and therefore reduce the error, increase the power of the analysis. Okay. Now, random effects are the, the part that is novel here, right? So I'll try to explain as clearly as I can possibly do. Uh, so there are contextual grouping factors. In, in, uh, in subtitling, you could have, for example, subtitles or participants or location of the experiment, country of provenance or video clips. We use two video clips. Now, why is that important? Well, you can, uh, you can imagine that, you know, even though in traditional analysis, each participant would look at, say, 100 subtitles, yes, but in the analysis, you would actually average the estimates that you got for each subtitle, yes, and you would use only one data point. But you can imagine that different subtitles have different mean fixation durations, different subtitles have different proportional reading times. And this variation between subtitles and participants, for instance, might be important. There, there almost always is variation. Yeah, I don't want to say always uh, because it's a very tricky word, but <laughs> uh, I think that if you can understand that if there are many subtitles, different subtitles will, different, will have different, let's say, scores, right? And the grouping factors are important. Here you have, for instance, the location of the experiment. Uh, let's say that uh, the experiment was conducted in, uh, I don't know, seven different labs, yes? And let's say that the labs are, the labs, they have a different environment, slightly different lighting, slightly different temperature, uh, different researchers. And uh, even if everything is scripted, yes? Even if the, even if the, the experiment and the instructions that the researcher give to the, gives to the participants are scripted, there could be some variation in scores, there could be some variation in performance between the participants, let's say, because of the location of the experiment. Yes, in, uh, in the field of second language learning, for instance, a common random effect is class. Imagine that you have, uh, that you conduct, you, you collect data from 100 students. Let's say that those students came from 10 different classes. Yes, uh, the classes have different teachers or even if you are teaching those 10 different classes, uh, the classes are different. They, are, they, they know each other better, the, the, the class has a different atmosphere. So you would expect that students from the same class will perform more similarly than students from a different class. So you would say that you know, the, 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 the results from, from students from one class would correlate more highly than the results from students you know, between classes. So these grouping factors, these contextual factors, they can be added to the model to explain more variance in the data. And when you explain more variance, you're basically you know, finding out a more, a little bit more about the reality. Let's say you are reducing the error. In other words, you're increasing the power. Okay, so this is the big advantage uh, of mixed models. Uh, one of the big advantage of mixed models, but of course, because of that, you need a lot of data. Okay, we'll talk about it at some time today. Uh, 
Yes, so it helps explain more variance in the data that fix, fixed effects cannot explain. Why the fixed effects cannot explain? Well, sometimes we just don't know what the source of variation is. I mean, you know, sometimes you collect data at nine in the morning, the, some of the participants are tired. Sometimes at 9 p.m., some of the participants are tired. Sometimes just after lunch, some of the participants are sleepy. You don't know, yes? And the random effects will help explain that. Uh, there are some variables that we can't measure uh, because we don't know they exist or because we couldn't measure them. There was no practical way to do that, or perhaps because we, uh, we didn't have the time or there were errors, yes, in the, in the analysis, for instance. And uh, even when we measure, for instance, uh, we've been talking about frequency, right? So we, we typically, in, uh, in second language acquisition, we, we typically control for the frequency of the words. So how frequently the words appear in the second language, in the target language, but in the first language is also important, actually. But we typically control for the second language because frequency of occurrence in the language is very highly correlated with proficiency. So the idea is that words that occur less frequently are less known or are known only by more advanced students. But of course, there are many things that come into play, right? Part of speech, cogniteness, for instance, sometimes the word is extremely rare in English, but, it's, uh, but it looks exactly the same and has the same meaning in the participant's first language. So that word will be known and frequency will be very low, but will be known by a basic student, for example. So there are many things that uh, you know, we can measure, they control to a certain extent, but it's just a, a mean direct measurement. It's not a you know, direct measure of what we were supposed to measure. Yes, so to summarize, the random effects will explain more variance in the data, and that will make the, the, the test, the, the, the results more reliable, okay? Now, so including random effects, uh, more error explained, more precision, more reliable results. Uh, you are able to check if the fixed effects, for example, different speeds are significant over and above differences between participants and subtitles. So if you, don't, if, if you don't have random effects, and let's say you compare 12 CPS to 20 CPS, you can find a significant difference or not between them. But if you use the random effects, you can say basically, okay, we found a significant difference between participants, irrespective of the individual differences between participants and subtitles. Okay, and then Jager uh, in 2008, just that's a quote for him, if a fixed effect, for example, in our case, speed is significant in such a model. This means it is significant after the variance associated with subject and items, in our case, subtitles, is simultaneously controlled for. Okay, so in other words, you have more control over your data. Okay, just one, one very important detail. Fixed effects, they can be factors, for example, categorical variables, and they can be covariates, for instance, continuous variables, but random effects can only be categories, okay? They might be string variables as we have today, they might be numeric variables, but they can only be categories. If you have a continuous variable, it has to be a fixed effect period. Okay. So, uh, this simple linear regression here graph looks a little bit weird, but let me explain why. Because this is, it, it was taken from our study. Okay, you remember we have two, two speeds, right? We have 12 CPS and 20 CPS. But obviously they were divided into two groups, 12 and 20. But the subtitles, they have uh, different speeds. Yeah, slightly different speeds, a little bit below 12, a little bit above 12, a little bit below 20, a little bit above 20. That's why the, 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 the scores here, the, the proportional reading time rates here, they are, you know, chunked, let's say, around 12 and around 20. But, you know, if you do a linear regression using this data, uh, you will get the line of best fit, just one. Yes, so you would probably... Uh, be able to conclude something like, on average, uh, participants increase the proportional reading time from 12 to 20 by this amount, on average. 
Yes. When you use mixed models, you consider everybody at once. Okay. Uh, this is just a, a, a way to visualize the data. I don't. Uh, I just wanted to show you that the black line here is the same line as before, the line of best fit. But with mixed models, and this is our data, you can see that every single thinner and colorful line is a different participant. And you can see that the different participants, they have different lines. Some of them start lower. Yeah, they start lower and they grow to an extent, let's say they have an intercept that is lower and they have a slope that has a certain, let's say degree of steepness, right? Others start high, but actually decrease as you can see. So there is a lot of variation between participants and the mixed model will account for that. Okay. Do you want to oh. say Brenna that just as a reminder what it really means, right? So it's about like 40% uh, of the time was spent on the subtitles while they were displayed. Okay, so you can see that for some people uh, with the speed, it increases, but not for everyone. Sorry to jump in. Thank you. And uh, for some of them, it actually decreases. Yeah, well, let's, we will see the, 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 the final graph at the end of the analysis, okay? Now, when you are entering uh, uh, random effects in the model, you can, you can enter them as random intercepts, random slopes, and basically both. And you can correlate them, okay? We, today, we will do only random intercepts and random slopes. I will explain in a second, okay? We will not correlate them for the sake of simplicity. That's it. Now, what do I mean by random intercepts, okay? Imagine that here we have the 12 and 20 uh, CPS speed. Um, imagine that we're talking about proportional reading time. So the black line in the middle here would be the, let's say the simple linear regression line, you know, the average there. And the colorful lines would be the different participants. Now, you can see that the participants have different starting points, let's say. Yes, they have different intercepts. They have different averages, each participant. Yes, they start at a different place here. But the slope between them is exactly the same. So the, the degree of increase, in this case increase, is exactly the same. That's why they are parallel. So for instance, let's say that uh, this one here at 12 CPS had a 30% proportional reading time, but at 20, at 20 CPS would have 35%, so an increase of five. This one started at 35%, but then there is also an increase of five, so 40%, yes? So we let the intersects vary, but we didn't let the slopes vary. And you know, this is not very realistic because it's very difficult to, to think of a data set where participants would have different starting points and all of them would uh, you know, learn to the same rate or look more at the subtitle to exactly the same rate. That's very unrealistic, right? So we have the intercepts and slopes. As you can see here, uh, different participants have different starting points, different averages as well, obviously, and they increase the slope, they increase in this case, only increase could be decrease as well, but in this case, only increase at different rates. Okay, so this is more realistic. Okay, because this is uh, more expected in the data. But uh, uh, Aga, uh, correct me, this, these graphs, they were created by David and it was based on uh, simulated data, right? Not on our data, I suppose. No, I think David used our data. Our this. data, okay. Yes. Okay, okay. Thanks. Uh, yes, it was created by David because it was created in R. Uh, I, it's, as far as I know, it's not possible to do that in SPSS. As I said, limitations. But anyway, it is also possible, for example, to ask for correlations. So what would you be looking at? Let's say if you assume that a participant that has a low intercept will have a steeper slope, and participants who have high intercepts will have a less steep slope, you would have a negative correlation. 
if you if you expect that participants uh, who have a low intercept will have a low slope and participants who have a high intercept will have a high slope, then you have a positive correlation. This is very common, for instance, uh, when you're talking about learning, right? Uh, let's say you do a pre-test and post-test. So the, the, the maximum score in the pre-test is 100. So if the person scored 90, so it's a very high intercept, the chances are that that person will increase the score just a little bit. So it will be a less steep slope, yes? Uh, if the person you know, scored 40, and then there was some sort of treatment teaching the person, and then there was the post-test, chances are that that person could score, could learn 30 or 40, so going to 70, going to 80, yes? In that case, the slope would be steeper. So in that case, it would have a negative correlation, yes? Because you start low, the slope is high. You start high, the slope is low. So if you assume that in your data, these correlations could exist, and very often they do, then you could enter uh, the correlations. Now, this is all pretty, right? You can enter the, the, the random intercepts, you can, random, you can enter both, and you can enter the correlation if you want, but random effects need a lot of data. So many times, as it will happen today, you will see that you don't find the effect that you're looking for, even though it makes theoretical sense, uh, but when you, you don't find the effect, it doesn't mean that the effect doesn't exist in real life. Perhaps you didn't find it because you don't have enough data to find it, okay? So again, it's, uh, it's advanced, it's very powerful, it will help us hopefully get more you know, precise uh, results in the future, help us replicate studies with more accuracy in the future, but we need more data. Okay, we were we were talking about uh, Aga mentioned today. It was mentioned yesterday how many participants you need. Well, this is really complicated. Uh, there is a paper in the reading list, Brisbane and Stevens from 2018. They talk about power analysis and mixed models. Please feel free to read the references there. Uh, they suggest at least 40 participants and at least 40 items per participant. So that would be 40 participants each participant reading at least 40 subtitles, yeah? Uh, and then most people, to the best of my knowledge, most people will tell you that in this case, participants and subtitles, it's much more important to have enough participants to the power than it is to have subtitles. So here, for instance, today, we have 18 participants. And uh, we will only, uh, some participants have over 100 subtitles. Okay, uh, but we only have 18 participants. So Brisbane and Stevens say at least 40. Matt Tayard and Davies, a recent, a recent paper published in Journal of Memory Language, they recommend between 30 and 50 participants. Yes, uh, so we have quite few and we will see that we will have some problems in the analysis because of that, okay? Uh, I can see that there are some notifications here. Is that are the no? I just pasted. I just pasted. I'm monitoring the chat. I just pasted the reference to the paper that you mentioned. I think we uh, need to move on. Okay. Okay. So uh, moving on. So first of all, sorry. Let's look at this. What is important when thinking about what random effects you can include? Yeah. Remember, we are talking about each line is a participant, yes, and we are talking about differences in speed. So the speed is our fixed effect, let's say, and we are talking about the same participant having different scores in 12 and 20 CPS. This is very important. The same participant has to have different scores at 12 CPS and at 20 CPS. So random effects will be within subject. Yes, you cannot, let's say if you have, instead of speed, let's say you have groups, group one, group two, but the group one has 10 participants, group two has 10 different participants. Yes, you cannot have the slope for participants, you know, for the groups because one single participant will not have scoring two different groups. That doesn't make any sense. Yes, 
Here we can because it was within subjects. So the same participant, think of the same participant as one line. The same participant had one score here and one score here. So we can fit that slope, okay? So let's look at our data now. We can ask for the participants intercept. So we would, uh, we would assume that, you know, different participants have different proportional reading times. Yes. Uh, we could fit the slope, you know, uh, speed by participant slope. And uh, that was what you saw in the graph basically. Yes. So each participant uh, read at 12 and 20 CPS. And we can assume that different participants, like the change in proportional reading time between 12 and 20 was different for different participants. Uh, we can fit the clip, the slope for clip, because remember, each participant watched two different clips. So the difference in, the difference in PRT between participants uh, and clips was different. And we can do the lines, one line or two lines. So different participants reacted, let's say, to subtitles that had one line or two lines in a different way. So those slopes we can fit because in this case, all participants read or watched at both speeds, all participants read or watched both clips, all participants read subtitles with both lines. But when it comes to the subtitles, we can have the intercept. We can assume that different subtitles have different proportional reading times on average. But uh, we cannot do this because different speeds, 12 and 20 CPS, they necessarily had different subtitles. Yes. Uh, they had to be shorter or longer in order to fit the, for example, the, 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 the screen time. Yes. We cannot do this because obviously different clips have different subtitles. And uh, we cannot do this because the subtitle either has one or two lines, not both. Yeah. So those are done. So those are the, the, the random effects that will fit. Okay. Now, uh, what about clips? Clips would be random effects because you know we were not our research question was not interested in comparing clips uh, as Agnieszka was saying we controlled for for clips or she controlled for clips they controlled for clips when they did the study back in 2018 they controlled to make sure that the clips were as comparable as possible right but still we could add those clips as random effects because as I've mentioned before there are so many things we cannot control for. There are so many unexpected circumstances, so many things that we don't know really, that it's just yes. safer to have them there. Yes, yeah? so uh, basically this is like the gray area uh, here, I have to admit. So we assumed the clips were the same. This is what Jan Noe Kruger also did in his uh, six oh. clips that he tested in the study that he mentioned. He didn't actually look into the differences between the clips because he assumed they are the same. That's what we did initially. But here with LMM uh, analysis, we can actually go back and revisit whether they actually are the same. Thanks. So why did we not, or why are we not going to include, for example, the intercept for clips? Because we don't have enough clips. Uh, according to few papers I have read, uh, you should have at least five or six levels, five or six clips in this case, uh, in order to include it as a random effect. Essentially, if we include clips as a random, uh, let's say the, the, the intercept for clips, we just won't have enough data. It won't compute. There will be an error. We will have to remove it anyway. Okay, so because we could not include clips as a random effect, we will include it as a fixed effect. Okay, so we will include the speed as a fixed effect. You will see it later. We'll include the lines as a fixed effect, and we will include clips as a fixed effect, and then the interaction speed clips and speed lines. Okay. So uh, those are the useful reading. Each of them is a little bit uh, commented on. Uh, I start with the, the ones that I consider the easiest, perhaps not the most reliable, but definitely the easiest to follow. And uh, it goes on becoming more and more difficult. And then you start seeing uh, very big names in the field, right? Um, 
Yes, um, I'm just sending this uh, presentation uh, in the chat so that everybody can access that. Okay. Um, yes, Bates is actually, as far as I know, the, the, the creator of the Lemaire, the linear mixed effects models in R. Yeah, so you have this, this paper here. Well, that, that's very useful reading there. And now uh, we can start in SPSS, but perhaps a break before or five minutes? Yes, I think, yes, uh, <laughs> we need, uh, I think, a five minute break and uh, uh, we'll be back um, eight past 11. And uh, those of you who have SPSS or who want to play uh, with the data can have a look at our data and explore this. And Brenna will take us by the hand uh, step by step in this exciting process of <laughs> LMM analysis. Thank you. OK, see you soon. Eight by 11. Okay, uh, so far, does anybody have any questions? Or can I move on? Okay, so I'll move on. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, question, okay, cool. I'll keep looking at the questions and tell you if there's uh, anything coming up. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, I hope you can see the data set clearly here. Let me just sort by participants. So yes. as you remember, uh, we don't have one row per participant. We have one row per subtitle. Yes, uh, the, the area of interest here was the full subtitle was not uh, the words. If we had the one area of interest per word, then we would have one row per word. So you can imagine how many data points we would have, right? Right now we have uh, 200, 2000 and, and something, yeah? But uh, we would have much more, yeah? But anyway, so here you can see, for instance, that only participant one had, uh, we have data for 135 subtitles for participant one, right? You can see that participant one uh, the, the 12 CPS in Grace and Frankie and 20 CPS in Gilmore Girls. Yes, it was counterbalanced. So if we go to a different participant, you will see the opposite, 12 CPS and Gilmore Girls and 20 CPS Grace and Frankie, okay? Uh, here, it's whether the subtitle had one line or two, and this is the proportional reading time. Okay, now we could have other measures, let's say, I don't know, fixation counts, number of words per subtitle, length of subtitle. Uh, we could have the, the part of speech, you know, the part of speech we couldn't because it's per subtitle, not per word, but we could have the average frequency, we could have the average concreteness, but we don't. Yes, uh, we didn't have the original study, but we could have, so you have an idea. So just to make things clear, you remember, right? Each participant, watched Grace and Frank in Gilmore Girls at two different speeds, yes? And uh, this is the data that we have. We have 18 participants. Now, there are different ways to build a model, okay? Essentially, you will build any model step by step, okay? There are different ways. Uh, there is disagreement. Uh, there is some arguing going on. Uh, for instance, there is this, this paper by Barr, uh, which is in the list, 2013, and uh, he 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 favors the maximal model. What is that? Well, think about everything. You have your data, and then you you think about all the fixed effects that make uh, you know theoretical sense based on previous research. You think about all the random effects that make theoretical sense based on previous research. You put everything in the model at once. You calculate it. As long as the model converges, it means as long as the model works, as long as there is no error, let's say, this is your final result, okay? And uh, then, uh, you know, Bates came to three years later and he said that this is not probably a good idea. It's probably better to go for a more parsimonious model, which essentially means that you will try to have the best model with fewer variables, depending on many criteria. So if you read their paper, it's also in the reading list, uh, the Bates and colleagues will explain 
how to reduce the maximal model so it becomes more parsimonious, fewer variables, while maximizing the effect size, okay? Because it's more powerful. And then uh, if you read Matt Teard and Davis, so Matt Teard and Davis also recommended is this, uh, this paper that I just mentioned. It's uh, from the Journal of Memory Language. And they essentially, they, they did a meta-analytic a meta analysis, I, if I remember correctly, or was it just literature review? It doesn't matter. Of over 400 studies that used linear mixed models. And uh, they calculated many things, compared results, and so on and so forth. And they, they, they recommend that uh, if you're doing exploratory research, you could start from the minimal model. If you are doing confirmatory research, you should start from the maximal model and reduce. We will start from the minimal model. Minimal to the maximal, that fits best. So essentially, we will start by entering the random intercepts and then the random slopes. Uh, and then uh, when we define our random effects, because we are not going to add correlations, then we can add our fixed effects, okay? Uh, I will be switching between SPSS, Microsoft Word, and the once or twice Excel for very quick calculations, okay? Everything has already been done. Everything is screen clipped here in Word for better visualization, but I will do step by step and then I will show the results here, okay? Let's start with the empty model. Uh, the empty model will serve as a baseline model to calculate the effect size later, okay? Again, the effect size is something that is controversial. We will use one way to calculate it. It's complicated to calculate effect size in mixed models, but because we are only going to use intercepts and slopes, it is a little bit easier. I will use one way that is kind of an approximation of what would be the partial x squared in ANOVAs, for instance, okay? So the empty model, let's have a look. You go to analyze, general linear model, sorry, mixed models, linear. Now, what's the difference here? Today, we're talking about linear mixed models. So we will have a, a continuous dependent variable, proportional reading time, yeah? Now, if you have, let's say, ordinal variables, if you have uh, categorical variables, uh, that are not ordinal. If you have binomial variables, like zero or one, yes or no. If you have a Poisson distribution, so a count variable, yeah, then uh, you will have to use generalized linear mixed models. Just like instead of using the general linear model for a simple regression, you would have to use the generalized linear models for a simple regression, okay? So here we have the PRT as a continuous variable, we can use the linear mixed models, not the generalized linear mixed models, okay? So subjects are our random effects, okay? I will move participants and subtitles. We agreed that we would have the intercept for both. I will put into subjects. Now, I am not defining the model yet. I'm just making it available, okay? For, the, for, the, for me to define the model later. Here, I'm just saying, hey, please consider this, these two variables later, I will need them. Continue. So this is the, the empty model. So I don't really need anything else for now. I will just put the dependent variable here. And uh, from the statistics, I will, for now, only take the, parameter estimates for fixed effects, <clears throat> okay? Moving on. So let's take some time to see what we have here. Perhaps I can start from the end, yeah. Uh, this is very important for us. Residual here, just like in a simple regression, just like in a you know, more traditional linear regression, fixed effects only regression, let's say, the residual is the error, okay? So let's say how much of the variance your model cannot explain, okay? This, this number here doesn't really mean much. 
out of context, but it is important for us to have this initial estimate here. Okay, as you can see, I put this here. It's the same thing, we just copy that, screen clipping. Okay. Good. Now, let's look at number of parameters, also very important. You have a total of two. Why two? You have one intercept for the fixed effects, and we ha you have one residual for the random effects, one residual for the model. One plus one, two. Where are they? Fixed effects, intercept, that's one. Residual, that's the second one. Okay, I will explain this later. Now, when you are building a model, uh, and we will do that uh, step by step, but when you're building a model, you have to look at the information criteria here. Uh, again, different ones are used for different things. Uh, the latest recommendation I'm aware of is that if you are doing exploratory research, if you are building from minimal to maximal, which is what we are doing here, you should use Ike. If you are doing confirmatory analysis, you should use BIC. I'm not going to get into details. There is one thing, and you know this is not in the slides you might want to write down. If you are comparing two models using Ike or BIC or any of these four, the fixed effects part of the model has to be the same. You cannot change the fixed effects. Okay. So if you, are, if you create a model now, and then you decide to, to add something to the model, you create another model, and you look at these numbers to see which one has the best fit, I will explain in a second, you cannot change the fixed effect. Today, because of the nature of our model building process, we will use the log likelihood, okay? And for, the li for you to be able to use log likelihood, the, the models have to be nested. What is it? Let's say that you have uh, one model now with two parameters. And then I will run the next model. The next model will have four parameters. So I have, a, let's call them a small model and a big model. My small model is nested within the big model because Everything that I can find that I have in the small model can also be found in the large model, okay? So when the models you are comparing are nested, everything from the smaller can be found in the larger, you can use log likelihood. This is what we will do today, okay? So we have the empty model, it is here. Now let's add the random intercepts. Remember the intercept for participants and the intercept for subtitles. Analyze, mixed models, linear. I put those here already. Let's go to random. The first effect I want is participants. So I just select participants and click on the arrow here, and I want the intercept, okay? Now, this is a little bit more advanced. We are not going to cover today, uh, but uh, variance components is essentially telling us, I just want the intercept, nothing else. It would be the same as identity in R, I suppose. Okay, next, the second effect I want is subtitles, intercept. Okay, so now I have the previous one is the, the intercept for participants. The next one is the intercept for subtitles. <clears throat> Continue, so far so good. Oh, I have to change the statistics. Now I am. Now I also want the tests for covariance parameters. This is essentially for the random effect. Okay. So these two should pretty much always be ticked apart from the empty model, of course. Okay, continue. <clears throat> now 
Now, let's see what we got. So we have four parameters. Well, obviously we had the fixed intercept that we had before. We have the residual that we had before, but now we have the intercept for participant and we have the intercept for subtitle. So one, 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 four. So we increased by two, yes? We can look at the information criteria here. Uh, before, the information criteria, uh, though I didn't even put it here because the empty model is just a baseline. We will see that later. Um, fixed effects, we don't have any yet. Now let's look at the intercept for participant and subtitle. You can see that both are significant, yes? Uh, what that means essentially is that there is different, you know, different participants have different PRTs, different subtitles have different proportional leading times. That is essentially what it means. Okay. Now, if you look at the data, you might wonder, uh, I don't know if you thought about it or not, but can you actually organize the data this way? Because there is something called independence of observations, right? Which means that each observation has to be independent from the other, yeah? But here we have more than 100 rows with the same participant. And you cannot say that the scores, all those scores from the same participant are independent. Of course, one score will be influenced by the other. They came from the same person, yes? So you can organize the data in this way when you are doing mixed models, because when you do this, you basically solve the problem of independence of observation, okay? So this tells us that uh, there is variation between participants in terms of PRT, there is variation between subtitles in terms of PRT. Now, these guys here, the estimates are very useful for us uh, especially because we are only using intercepts and slopes, no correlations. Let me show you very quickly in Excel what these guys here mean, okay? <clears throat> it's a very simple sum and proportion calculation. So let's put here residual. Let me zoom in, I suppose. Let's put here participant intercept. Yes, let's put here subtitles intercept. Now I'll double click on that table so I can actually just copy the whole thing. Okay, so let's put the residual here. The participant intercept I'll put here. The subtitle intercept I will put here. Now let's calculate the total of this thing. You know, simple sum function here. There you go, so this is the total. Now let's calculate the proportions, okay? So this divided by this is the proportion. This divided by this is the proportion. This divided by this is the proportion. Let's, let's go ahead and do it. So I can, this divided by this, uh, since I don't want to change this, perhaps I can use F4 here. And I can just slide down here. Fantastic. Yeah. So you can see that this is basically H4 divided by H8. This is H5 divided by H8. Oh, sorry, this one. Yeah. H8. There you go. Now, what does it mean? Well, this means proportions. Let's turn to percentages. So, so far, so far in our model, 20% of the variance in proportional reading time can be explained because of differences between participants. 23% of variance uh, in the PRT scores can be explained because of differences between subtitles. And 57% of the, of the variance in PRT scores cannot be explained probably because there are things, let's say within participants and within subtitles that we did not account for, yeah? Remember though, that right now the residual was 237. Remember that in the empty model was 406. So we've already reduced by almost 50%. 
Yeah. Anyway, moving on, we have the same table here. Let's add the slopes. Back to SPSS, let me close this thing here. Analyze, mixed models, linear. It's already there, okay? Before I edit the slopes, uh, I have to remember when I did this here, I told you, look, I am not creating the model yet. I'm just making it available for the future. When I move my variables here, I will only be making it available for the future. To create the model, I have to come here. Okay. So let me make it available so I can actually create the random slopes. Now, we have the speed, it's a categorical variable. We have clip and we have number of lines. All of them are categorical variables, right? And uh, I could move them to factors. That, that is what is expected. However, I can also move them to covariates. Why? Uh, because there are only two levels. Speed is only 12 and 20. Clip, it's only Gilmore Girls and Grace and Frankie. And number of lines only one and two. When I move them to covariates, I assume that there is a linear relationship between the levels. But if there are only two levels, the relationship can only be linear. So every time you have a factor with two levels only, it is okay to move them to covariates. You can also move them to factors. In terms of results, you will get the same thing. What is the difference for SPSS? The difference is that if I move to factors, when I get my results, the reference category will be the, the higher category. So let's see here. So if I move to factors, the reference category will be one for speed, so 20 CPS, will be one for clip, so Gilmore Girls and it will be two lines. If I move to covariates, the reference category will be the same that I believe is in R, zero. And I want it to be zero. So I'm moving to covariates, that's the only reason. Again, because there are only two levels, I could put in factors or covariates, but because I want the reference category to be zero, I will put it into covariates, okay? Again, this, the fixed effects are not defined. This is just, you know, telling the model that the, 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 the variables are available for the future. Let's go to random though. Let's add our slopes. Let me go back. So in the slides, we agreed that we could have speed, clip, lines, slopes for participants, right? I don't want interactions between all of them. I could, but I don't. We're keeping things simple here. So I just want the slopes. So now I will have the participant intercept. I will have the speed by participant slope, the clip by participant slope, and the lines by participant slope. Essentially, I'm asking the model, for example, if you consider speed, I'm asking the model to find out if different participants change PRT from 12 to 20, speed, yes, to different extents, okay? Now, here I have intercepts and slopes. I could put variance components or I could go for diagonal. It would be exactly the same thing. I will stick to variance components. It will give us uh, intercepts and slopes anyway, okay? So next, I think we agreed that we wouldn't put anything for subtitles, just the intercept, so it stays as it is, okay? Uh, the statistics are fine. And so far, that's all. Moving on. <clears throat> as you can see, there was an error. Uh, I'm not going to get into details what the errors mean, but if there is an error, the model is not valid. You cannot report this model, okay? 
Let's look at our you know, famous table here. So we have the fixed effects intercept, that's one parameter. We have the participant intercept, plus the speed, plus the, the clip, plus the line. So we have four, so that's why you have four here. We have the intercept for subtitles, you have one, and you have the residual, one. So one plus four, five, six, seven, that's what you have, parameters seven, okay? If you go down, you can see that uh, the intercept for participant is significant. You can see that the speed for the, the slope, uh, the speed slope by participant is also significant. You can see that the lines slope by participant is significant, and you can see that the subtitle intercept is significant, but we have a problem here, yeah? Uh, this was not computed. Now, uh, I think that Bates said that, uh, well, I don't remember his quote, it's too fancy for my memory, but uh, you know, the fact that the estimate is zero does not mean that it does not exist. It just means that it was not possible to find it in your data. It's difficult to know why, uh, but I would suggest just guessing that it's because we only have 18 participants. Remember what I told you that uh, you should have between 30 or 50 or somebody, or Brisbane said between four, uh, uh, 40, yes? So let's say between 30 and 50, we have 18. So we don't have much data really. So perhaps that was the reason. But anyway, this could not be estimated. And this is the reason for the error. So we should remove that. Okay, but before we remove that, let's look at the log likelihood and uh, let's look, let's compare it to the previous model. Again, I'm doing that just for pedagogical purposes. This model is not valid. Okay, so I, I, I wouldn't even compare because it's pointless. I can't even consider this model, but let's do it. Okay, so how do you do that in SPSS? Uh, remember, the previous one, when I only had the intercepts, was 2358. Let's think about 358 only. It's easy to remember. So 358. When I added the slopes, I increased the parameters from four to seven. But I reduced this from 358 to 200. So there is a difference of 158, more or less. Yes. Now, those information criteria measures, they work as in, 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 like the lower, the better. So the lower it is, the better for you. So if you add a random effect, yes, you are making your model more complex. Uh, you need to reduce this to a certain extent in order to make it worth adding those, those, those extra effects. Okay, so here I added three parameters. That's why I have been counting. There were four, now there are seven, but it reduced from 358 to 200, yeah? So question is, does adding those three parameters um, uh, create a better fit? In other words, is the three parameters worth the reduction or vice versa? I'm not sure. Now, I believe that in R, you create different models and then you compare the models using an ANOVA, yes? In SPSS, there is no option for that, but we can, we can use this, uh, 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 a quick trick. Now, log likelihood follows a chi-square distribution. So what we can do is remember, the difference is 158, roughly, yeah? And the, the difference is three parameters. So I can go to SPSS, I can go to compute variable. Let's call this variable significance, okay? And what I can do is I can use this little function here, sig, chi sq, chi square, 
If you cannot see it, it's a SIG, S-I-G dot chi square, so C-H-I-S-Q, open brackets. The difference was 158, and there was a difference of three in the parameters. Yeah. So when I click OK, I can go back to my variables. And now you have a different, uh, you have a different column there that I called significance. And the zeros that you see there, they are basically the p-value. So you can say that there is a significant difference between the models. You can say that it was worth it adding the three parameters because the reduction was large enough. Yes. So I would prefer the, the, this, this later model with seven parameters. Yes, I would. I won't because there was an error. Yeah. Moving on. So what was the error? The error was the participant clip slope. Yeah. Let's remove this guy here. Mixed models, linear. Everything is there. Everything is there going to random back to participants. So the problem was clip. Let's select clip, let's remove clip. So only speed lines and only the subtitle will be set. Continue. <clears throat> no errors, we are good. Instead of seven parameters, I have six parameters. It's the same, uh, 20, 200, yes, yeah, so it's the same 200, but I have one parameter fewer, which makes it better. Uh, smaller model, same fit, better for me, yeah? Fixed effects is still not there, and I have everything here already. So the participant intercept is significant. To repeat, this means that different participants have different particip uh, PRT scores, Subtitle intercept significant. This means that different, different subtitles have different PRT scores. Participant speed slope. This means that the, the, the changes between 12 to 20 CPS are different in different participants. And the participant lines slope. This means that the changes in PRT score between you know, uh, subtitles with one line and two lines differ to different extents between participants, yes? This is it. So, you know, I could, now I could add correlations. I am not going to, okay? I could, if we have time at the end, I will show you how to do it. Well, I'll show you how to do it now, but we can play, we can play with it. We probably won't. But uh, FYI, uh, if you want to add correlations, Just go to random effects again. Let's go back to participants. Now I have variance components here in covariance type, which means I only want the intercept and the slopes. If I want to add correlations, I have many different options. I believe that the standard, the default in R is unstructured. And it's called unstructured because it doesn't set any limitations. Basically, it will try to find the correlations between everything. The correlations between the intercept and one slope, the intercept and the other slope, the correlation between the two slopes without any limits, yes? Uh, for example, this one here, AR1 heterogeneous is very, very popular for, uh, let's say longitudinal studies. And the idea here is you will Prana, have- Prana, didn't we say we're not going to get into this perhaps? Uh, yes, but we have- Are you guys still with us? <laughs> Hopefully. Okay, so fine. I'll just finish this one. So if you're measuring pretest, post-test, for example, the, you, you will find a, a correlation between the pretest and the post-test. And then if you have a second post-test and a third post-test, the assumption is that the correlation becomes weaker and weaker and weaker with time. So you know that, uh, that there is material online, the, those readings that I sent, they explain each of them. You can have a look later, okay? I'm not gonna explain all of them, but because we're not doing correlations today, so good. Fine, so I have this here, just final words. 
between the covariance parameters. Uh, there is a problem with this walled Z test, okay, uh, which is not the same as in R. Uh, walled Z test is a two tailed test. So the assumption of this test is that it could go both ways. Yeah, let's say in our case, the estimate could be positive or negative. However, estimates cannot be negative. They can only be zero or higher. So it is advised for the walled Z test when you are calculating intercepts and slopes, which can only have a variance of zero or higher, to divide this by, by two. In other words, to make it one tailed. Okay, if you have a correlation, then it's okay. But if you don't, then you should divide this by two. We will see that later this will not be significant, but it will still make the model better, exactly because you should divide by two. Okay, fine. Let's add the fixed effects now. <clears throat> Do you have any questions? We finished the random effects part of the model. Yes, perhaps now is a good time to ask any questions. Uh... If you're still with us, I asked this question two minutes ago, nobody answered. <laughs> yes, we are. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Any questions about the random effect so far? Everything is clear so far. And that's a comment from the chat. So I suppose we can move on. All right, moving on. Thank you. So uh, continue. Now let's introduce the fixed effects. Now I could uh, enter full factorial, just select everything and do this. I am not going to do this. I will stick to the, to the facts that we have in the original study, okay? Uh, which were, we wanted the main effects for speed, clip, and lines. Okay. And uh, we wanted the interaction between speed and clip. Just remember to select interaction here. And we wanted the interaction between speed and lines. Okay. This is it. Now, I will add one thing here that I haven't talked about before. Uh, and it's not in the slide, so you might want to make notes. When you go to, where is that? Estimation here. I haven't been there yet. Uh, look, those two methods you will read in your reading later. I'm not gonna change anything here, but those two methods, the most popular methods I believe in mixed models, restricted maximum likelihood, maximum likelihood. Restricted maximum likelihood should be used when you are comparing models that have the same random effects, when you are changing the random effects. Maximum likelihood should be used when you are changing fixed effects. And at the end, you should report with restricted maximum likelihood. Uh, yes, but I'm not going to change anything here. We have been doing random effects. We have been doing restricted maximum likelihood. Now we will just add all the fixed effects at once that we need to answer our research questions anyway. So it will be there, okay? Now, the degrees of freedom. The residual method would be the same method that you find in ANOVAs or you know, in general linear models uh, in general, yes? Uh, with the, the regular degrees of freedom. But there is a problem with calculating degrees of freedom in, in mixed models. And there are different approximations. Um, those are two of the most common. I'm not sure which one is the default in R. I think it's Ken Ward Roger. I'm not sure, please somebody correct me. Um, the, the residual method would be advised uh, as far as I have read only when you have a lot of data and uh, some people call a lot, a hundred participants and at least a hundred items per participant. And when the data are balanced, so let's say you have 100 participants, two groups, so 50 participants, 50 participants, 
uh, and uh, each participant has more or less the same number of subtitles per participant, right? So we're not going to use this. We are going to use the this approximation. Maximum iterations. An iteration is the number of times the software tries to make the model work. So it calculates the model once if it works good. If it does, it calculates again and again and again and again and again until it does. It follows all this criteria here, which I'm not going to change. I don't recommend you do, but if you want to read about it, there is literature out there, okay? But the only difference here is that R has a default of 150. So SPSS tries to calculate 100 times before saying the model could not converge. R tries 150 times before saying the model could not converge. We will not have a problem with this here. So I will just keep as it is. It won't make any difference really. Okay, that's it. We have our fixed effects. We have our two statistics of interest. Uh, and that's all for now. <clears throat> it's calculated, you can see iteration one, two, three. So it's iterating the model. It's trying to calculate the model. The model has been calculated. We have 11 parameters we can count. Fixed effects, intercept, main effect, main effect, main effect, interaction, interaction, all of them one. We have the participant intercept, the speed, uh, slope, the line slope, so three. We have the subtitle intercept, so one. We have the residual, the error of the model one, so total 11. We have the information criteria here. Uh, you can see that it was reduced from 200 to 143, so the model has a better fit now. We could calculate, remember, we could go to transform, compute variable, so there is a difference of what, 70, you know, 57 now, right? 200 minus 143, so 57. And uh, it went from six parameters to 11. So that's um, five. We could calculate that just to redo. Yes, of course, it was significant again. No. I mean, it's not important because we need the, significant, the fixed effects anyway, right? Let's look at the results. First of all, you can see that the, the slope for participants in lines became non-significant, even though the estimate is actually pretty high. Now, remember, you have to divide this by two. When you divide 0 0.5 by two, you have 0 0.25. So it is significant, right? I can show you that if I remove this from the model, I will have one parameter fewer, but the fit will be worse. I can show you, uh, it's not necessary, but if I remove this, just go there and remove this, it will reduce one parameter, but the fit will be worse. In other words, this here will be higher. So it means that this model that we have now is better because this helps explain variance. More or less, this is what it means, okay? Let's look at the fixed effects. Now we can interpret this just as we would interpret a multiple regression. Let me go to the uh, uh, to Microsoft Word here. Uh, maybe I will focus the whole thing. Remove this thing from my site. There you go. Make it a little bit lower, lower. Okay. All right. So let's try to remember the reference categories. Okay. So the reference categories here are zero. So the reference category for, for lines is one line. The reference category for 12 C, for, for speed is 12 CPS. And the reference category for clips is Grace and Frankie. Okay. You have the references here for your information. Now, the intercept here, 32 PRT, so 32%, that's the proportional reading time, when everything is zero. So that's 32 when uh, speed is zero, so 12 CPS. When clip is zero, so Grace and Frankie, so we are looking at the blue one here, and we are looking here. And when lines is zero, 
So one line. Now you can see that 32 is not 36, but that's because here, this 32 is when lines, when, when the subtitles have only one line. And here we have just all subtitles, right? So it's slightly different, but you get the picture, yeah? Similarly to speed, yeah? So now the reference is zero. So what you get here is the estimate for speed one and speed one is 20 CPS. So again, we can say that with clip zero, Grace and Frankie, yeah, with clip zero, the change between speed zero and one from 12 to 20 CPS will increase PRT by 11. So from 32 to 11, you have 43, more or less. Again, because here we are considering two lines and in this case it will be only with one line, the reference category, right? But you can see more or less that increases by 11. So from more or less 36 to more or less 47. Yes, 47 will be here in the middle. So that's what speed means. Let's look at clip. Uh, clip, so this one is the estimate for clip one because the reference is zero. So this is essentially the difference between the clips when speed is zero and with one line, yeah? So speed zero here, yeah, here. The difference between clips, the two lines, when lines are zero, unfortunately, this is not plotted here, but let's see. So the difference between clips at speed zero, 12 CPS is more or less seven PRT. You can see the differences between 36 and 44. So here it shows more or less eight. But remember, this is the data for all lines together, all subtitles together. And uh, this is the estimate only for one line. Yeah. Now for lines, we can't see, but you can, you know, this is the estimate for number one. So for two lines, so subtitles with two lines, they have an increase of PRT of seven in speed zero, in clip zero. So 32 plus seven. 39 PRT. Is huh? it speed clip? Uh, Rena, is that a good time to answer some questions in the chat? If anybody has a question, yes. Yes, uh, if you could look at the chat or you want me to read it, uh, whichever is easier. You or Valentina, like maybe you want to unmute yourself and ask that. Perhaps that will be the best way. Uh, yeah, so the first question is, uh, I think you, I heard you say that in R, the maximum number of model uh, fitting iterations is 150, uh, which I didn't know. Uh, where did you get this information from? Does it come from a paper, stack exchange, comments? Thank you very much. I didn't say that the maximum was 150. I said that the default number of iterations is 150. Uh, if, the, if R tries to build, build the model, iterates the model for... Uh, 150 times and it's not successful, it will return convergence issues. Uh, I read it in a paper, uh, don't remember which right now, and, uh, I, and I heard from a colleague who uses R, that's all. I cannot tell you that this, this, this is uh, okay. very accurate information, but I did read in a paper. I'm sure that you can change the yeah, number you of can. iterations. Yeah, you can R. increase the number of iterations by, by quite a lot. I just wanted to point that out. That's and then uh, but uh, I, I mentioned that it was the default, not the maximum. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, that clarifies a lot. And the default can definitely be changed. So that's all clear now. Um, and then uh, you mentioned a couple of statements about REMO and, uh, and uh, so restricted and non-restricted maximal likelihood. And I couldn't hear what you said. The only thing I managed to write down, but it could be wrong, is that um, uh, the maximal likelihood is, is used when you're changing kind of fixed effects, whereas the restricted one has something to do with random effects. Could you just sort of uh, uh, repeat this and, and tell us if uh, this is also something that you just heard from, uh, from someone or if there is a reference for this that we can go then and quote? Uh, there, are, there, are, there are a few references for this, actually. Uh, I recall reading this in a couple of books and at least a couple of papers. Um, the, and, and what is the difference though? So when you yeah. say that? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so first of all, this is not something that I heard from someone. This is something that I read in a, a few or several papers and books. 
uh, about linear mixed models. I am sure that this, there is somebody out there who might disagree with that, but this is the, 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 the latest information uh, that I have uh, based on you know, recent publications. Uh, and the idea is that when you are changing the random effects, when you're comparing models that have different random effects, you should use restricted maximum likelihood. And when you are comparing uh, models that have different fixed effects, you should use maximum likelihood. Uh, but at the end, when you come up with your final model, the model that you, that you report should be reported with restricted maximum likelihood. Okay, uh, okay that's really uh, useful. I think a lot of a lot of times R sort of makes this choice automatically, which is uh, why I hadn't heard this because obviously it will know if you have what you have changed, and so it uh, it fits the model using um, these methods at the beginning. So when you fit the model, you press run the model, and then it gives you output. At the beginning of the output, it tells you whether it was whether the model was fit using Reml or ML. Um, mm -hmm. But I've never heard of this, so I think it's probably because maybe it's it's uh, implicit in our it could be. Um, if you said that you have references for this, do you mind digging them out and putting them in the chat today or tomorrow? Uh, I will dig them out. I have a, I have a few notes from a couple of references, but not from all of them because you know I didn't repeat my notes for every single time that I saw this. But yes, I will. I, I can. Perfect. I can Thank even you send so you an email if you want. Uh, I believe, you know, because, for example, there is this book that is in the references, it's a book by Garson, and uh, it's actually an interesting book because he talks about mixed effects models, and then he goes, you know, building from the empty model to a longitudinal model, you know, a more complex models, and uh, he does the analysis, every single model he shows in SPSS, SAS, STATA, HML, and R, yeah, and uh, I believe if I remember correctly, that uh, it's not automatic in R, no. I be, there is a default. I don't remember what the default is, but uh, to change that, I think you had to enter a comment, a comment like false equals R. Yeah, R yeah, R REMO R. equals false. Yeah, 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 that's, really, yeah, that's, that's like just that. the way you do it. Yeah, that's really, that's, that's quite easy to do. You just, but you know, when do you do it? Because you can just insert a comment, but you have to have rationale for doing it. So. Um, okay. So yeah, I'll send so you references. Perfect. Thank you so much. Welcome. Anybody else? I got anything else in the chat? I think there is another question here. Uh, yes, Christoph, would you like to uh, ask it or you want me to read it out? has some uh, low uh, frequency uh, words, so I'll try to read that out. Is there anyone who uh, used Jamovi toolsuit for mixed models? Uh, and then there's a name of the library. I think that's a question to those of you who uh, work in R. That is not for Breno, unless Breno, you know. Nope, I don't know. So uh, Valentina is asking uh, whether Krzysztof means in R and she says that she's done uh, a workshop on generalized additive models, I suppose. Is that what you mean? And we're waiting for a response from Krzysztof. Perhaps it's easier if you just unmute your mic and uh, go ahead and answer. <laughs> yeah, hello, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I was just asking about Jamovi. It was this very specific tool. It's uh, open source and basically it's uh, highly uh, rely on our our library, Lemaire, I think. Uh, so the computation is is the same, but the interface is uh, a little bit more user friendly because it's very similar to SPSS. So you can just you know click. Uh, most of the uh, parts, however, uh, I tried to follow uh, Breno with with uh, Jamovi, and I found it difficult to to build this model uh, based on uh, only intercept intercept only model. And I think that it's something with with uh, with with the library or or the Jamovi itself. It's a very specific question. So if you if you don't use this, uh, yeah. Uh, well, the only the only thing that I can answer, uh, I've I've never used Jamovi. I've heard of it. Uh, I've heard I've been recommended to try. I've never even downloaded it. Uh, but you know this book that I just mentioned that actually compares, uh, you know, Stata, SAS, 
uh, SPSS, HTML, and R. Like when it comes to linear mixed models, uh, the, the, the algorithm behind the SPSS and R and SAS and, and STATA is the same, actually. There is a slight difference with the random effects part of the model, because as I mentioned before, that wall Z test is a two-tailed test. So you should, uh, if you're talking about intercepts and slopes, you should divide the p-value by five, and I think uh, by by two, sorry. And uh, Wald Z is also known for having problems computing estimates that are very close to zero. So, for example, remember when I put the speed clip slope there, and it was zero. Uh, it was perhaps zero, so it couldn't compute. There was an error in the model, perhaps because the test was Wald Z or simply because we don't have enough data for that. I haven't done that in R. Uh, it uses a different, uh, a different test, not WALD-Z. Uh, perhaps that would have been different there. But when it comes to fixed effects, the algorithm, according to this book, it's Garson 2019, it's in the references there, is the same. Generalized mixed models, on the other hand, uh, I think because you don't really have the ML or REML, you have some pseudo likelihood or quasi likelihood calculation. And uh, the algorithm of R uh, is um, Lasse Lance, I, I, I don't recall now, it's different from the one uh, from SPSS, and the results will be different. Brenna, there's a question. Um... The, this um, publication that you mentioned that compares uh, the same calculations with different uh, stats uh, is that a book? Yeah, you, you just it's a book. That. Okay, it's, yes. Uh -huh. And uh, also in the chat, uh, Isa uh, says that there's this program HLM, which I think you mentioned as being used in the book, uh, that's devoted only to hierarchical uh, linear models. And Isa says it's easy to use, so perhaps, <laughs> you know, it's worth trying uh, as well. So uh, yes, I don't think we have any more questions here in the chat. So okay, okay, just uh, just just out of curiosity, again based on this book, uh, I am not going to cover mixed uh, uh, model diagnostics today. You know, with standardized residuals, look for uh, normality, homogeneity of variance, and such. I'm not going to cover this today. Uh, in SPSS, the only thing we can do is save the residuals and then explore the residuals. Uh, R has a few more functions, but not many. Uh, it seems that Stata uh, has lots of them, like the same, uh, those Cook's distance uh, DF, standardized DF that uh, Mala Hobies, I don't remember what it is, leverage. You can use all those that you typically use with linear models, you can use with mixed models, but not in SPSS and apparently not in R. Yeah, so yeah, pros and cons here and there. Anything else? Uh, no, I think Rates recommends uh, some, there's some good papers and a book by uh, John Neslek. So if you want to dig into that, uh, that's a suggestion as well. But I do. no more is questions. It, is it in the chat there? Yes, but no title. So perhaps Crates can uh, dig that out and uh, post the full uh, reference uh, in the chat uh, in the meantime. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm going to uh, Google for the book uh, title. Uh, it's easy to Google uh, John Gnez like multi multi level uh, models. Yeah, Excellent. You brilliant. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, but uh, I have a question actually, and mm -hmm. if uh, you don't mind, uh, uh, you said about it, but uh, uh, I still wonder uh, whenever I feed the models uh, with LMM, um, what is the rule of thumb uh, to choose for which uh, independent variables uh, to set uh, mm, random intercepts and random slopes. Uh, should everyone do all always random intercepts and random slopes, which would be strange, or how we decide how to do it? Uh, that's a very important question. It's a very difficult question, right? It's uh, I don't think that I can answer this, and I don't think that there is an answer for that. Uh, if you go back, if I mean, to the best of my knowledge, if you go back to the maximal model, uh, you essentially will fit all the slopes that you have access to, as long as they make sense, obviously, 
uh, as I was explaining before, it has to be within participants. And then you can uh, decide to keep them there because you know, based on previous studies, the slope should be there and uh, it will affect the results. So it should be there. That would be more, as far as I understand, more of a confirmatory analysis, right? Uh, but then you know, Bates comes later and says, well, but that reduces the power of the model. Why should you keep uh, random slopes in your model that don't explain any of the variance, like the estimates is zero or close to zero? I mean, doesn't make any sense. Just remove those you will end up having simpler models that explain the same amount of even more variance. In other words, you have more power, yeah? Uh, and then there is the idea uh, in this very recent paper that uh, based on the, the literature review that if you, if you are exploring the data, if it's an exploratory study and you start with the random effects, then uh, you should go for the one with best fit. So keep including the, you, you, they say, start with the intercepts, all the ones that make sense for you. Keep only the ones that, you know, improve the model. So the ones that are significant and that reduce fit. Yes. And then add the slopes, the same thing. And then add correlations, the same thing. And then when you find the best random effects model, you go for the fixed effects. But this is it. Um, uh, also, the, the, in terms of power, I mean, how much is too much? How much data do you need for how many covariants and how many factors? I, I don't know. The, the rules of thumb that I read are the ones that I said between 30 or 50 or at least 40, but they don't really specify uh, based on how many predictors, covariants, and random effects. They don't. It is, you know, LMMs, as you know, is a relatively recent thing. And uh, if we're still arguing over what a t-test is and when to run it and if we should use a manual with a t-test, I think that with mixed models we'll be arguing about very important details for many years to come, right? But this is just the impression that I have. I think somebody raised their hand. Thank you. Uh, Valentina raised, uh, raised their hand. Yeah, I just perhaps wanted to add a couple, of, uh, a couple of things. I think it will depend on the design as well, right? For example, um, in terms of intercepts for subjects and for items, right? We can't, there's a simple, very simple consideration to be made. You can um, edit and then change and modify your experimental design as to only select specific items, right? Uh, we can't quite do the same with participants in a way. Participants will always have individual variations. So if so, it, it's a combination of, of, uh, of, of reasons why I would choose one or another. If, for example, you don't have much data, so there's not much, many data points, then you simply cannot, there's no power enough in the model to fit uh, all the, so uh, Breno was really comprehensive. He had a random intercept for subject, a random intercept for items, and then random slope for, was it speed? So um, in theory, you can have random slopes for all your fixed effects, right? But doing so, unless you have hundreds of thousands of thousands of, of, of data points is going to make your model unidentifiable, uh, at least in R, this is the terminology used. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's always a sort of balancing act between, okay, so if we had to choose, going back to the items versus participants, often I would think, okay, uh, if I have um, you know, selected the subtitles so that they are all two liners, so that they <coughs> don't have uh, similar difficulties in the, in the in the world they have a similar land um you know then then we, we can then perhaps i will not if the day if the if i don't have enough data i will not and i have to make a decision of what random effect not to include i will go for taking off the random effect for item uh, because uh, I would like, I want to keep the random intercept for participants because participants always by definition will have individual variation within them, right? So it's, so it's a sort of, um, uh, a sort it's a of, sort of a complicated balance. <laughs> yes, it's a complicated balance. Exactly, exactly. And what I have seen also in published research, uh, I mean, which is, doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do, but it's just what I see more is that people just go for the intercepts first. And then if there is enough power and, and space in the model to try and fit random random slopes, then they fit random slopes, right? It also depends on your uh, research questions, uh, however, or, and, and from previous research, as Breno was saying earlier, right? Because if you have found from previous studies, they use the same models and similar variables that, you know, speed has an effect and, and, and is a, has a differential effect 
uh, you know, on, on your dependent variable, then you will have to fit a random slope for speed, right? So it's, a, it's this kind of mix between what you can and cannot do, what your data allows you to do, uh, what other researchers said, uh, and your research design, uh, I would say. I don't know if Breno... Yes. Yes, 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 I agree. I just wanted to add a few things. Uh, it is true, I, uh, in my experience, and also based on what I have read, uh, the, 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 the estimates for participants, so participants almost always, always have variation between them. The estimate for participants, uh, this is what I'm talking about here. So the estimate for participants is almost always higher than the estimate for, for subtitles, not in our case, apparently, but yeah, this is what I read. This is what I, this is the, 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 the experience that I have in second language research, right? Second language acquisition research. Uh, and yes, uh, technically you can fit all the slopes for your fixed effects, but we have to remember that this fixed effect has to be within subject, right? For example, remember uh, we didn't fit, I didn't fit the, let's say, clip subtitle slope because different clips have different subtitles, right? It wouldn't make any sense to fit that in the model. You cannot calculate the change of one subtitle between clips if the, cl if the subtitle only appears in one clip. So you have to think about what you can fit before you actually decide to fit. And yes, and then you have, for example, many people use, uh, most people, I would say, at least in my field, they use random effects just to explain extra variance. They don't use random effects to find any, uh, uh, they don't, to, to, to create any hypothesis about anything. It's just to, 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 to help control for the fixed effects, essentially, right? In that case, adding random effects as long as the as long as it's making the the the, the, the model fitter let's say the, the 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 information criteria lower yes it's creating better models and you have enough data for that of course then it, sh it should be okay yes but it is it is complicated and i agree there is a lot of disagreement there's a lot of thinking going on and it's uh, it's mind mind-boggling sometimes but it is very important very powerful and you should learn how to do that that's why I keep trying. <laughs> uh, guys, uh, I can see that there are lots of comments there, but do you mind if I move on? Because I still have you know, a few things to talk about. Yes, I think you're good, Brennan. So you can move yeah. on. Nothing uh, urgent in the chat. OK, cool. All right. Uh, so remember, we talked about speed, but this is for speed one when everything else is zero. We talked about clip. This is for clip one when everything else is zero. We talked about lines. This is for line one when everything is zero. Let's look at this speed clip interaction. Try to understand it a little bit more. It's just like a multiple regression, uh, but the, the regression, the, the, the interaction is a little bit more complicated. So remember, the speed for clip zero would increase from 32 to more or less 33, assuming that you have clip zero, that's the, the blue one there, and uh, one line, which is zero, yes? So it will be about 33. Now here we have the interaction. So what you have here is not speed one for clip zero. What you have here is speed one for clip one. So we are not talking about the blue one anymore. We are talking about the orangish one here. And this minus five does not mean that the slope goes down. This minus five means that the slope is no longer 11. The slope now is 11 minus five. So the slope will be more or less six from 44 to 50. So you can see that, uh, first of all, initially at this speed, the PRT for GF was lower. But you can see that the PRT for GF increases steeper, 11 points, than the one for GG, only six points. This is what the interaction says. Again, assuming that lines are zero, so one line, yeah? Okay, so this is how you can interpret the interaction here. And um, finally, uh, this is not our final model. Uh, <laughs> our final model is down there. Although perhaps I have to talk about effect sizes. Let's talk about this first. Look, one simple way uh, to calculate effect sizes in mixed models, one way could be controversial, 
and that can only be used when you only have intersects and slopes is to go for the residual of the empty model. Remember the first one there? And the residual of the last model, the one I just showed you, and calculate the, 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 the proportion. So you have the, the, res, the, the, the residual of the empty model minus the residual of the final model. So you will find the, 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 the reduction in error. In other words, the improvement, yes? Divided by the initial value. And then you will get 45.82%. So you can say that uh, the effect size, something that approximates partial at the squared in our model is 45.82%, okay? Now, you can also look at something called intraclass correlation coefficient, ICC. Again, because we only have intercepts and slopes. Now, I've already prepared this for the sake of brevity. <clears throat> it's open. Uh, this is what we got in SPSS. 220, 56, 37, 15, 66. It's all here. Okay. So as before, I calculated the total here. And now I will divide this by this to get the proportion. This by this to get the proportion. This by this to get the proportion. So I have the proportions here. Okay. Now, I explain here. So the participant intercept, the proportion is 14.32. So our final model shows us that 14.32% of all the variability in PRT lies between participants. 9.4 of all the variability in PRT lies in the different rates of change between 12 and 20 CPS, that's the slope. 4% of the variability PRT lies in the different rates of change between subtitles with one and two lines, and 16% uh, of the variability between subtitles. So you might be wondering, right? Um, I wasn't planning to talk about that. It's ready, but we have some time, I will. You might be wondering, so the total model explains 45% of the variance, and the random effects alone Explain how much? Let's sum it up. Whoa, almost everything. <laughs> so yeah, but it, it, this is not true, okay? Uh, I will show you. Uh, so you can see that the random effects explain a lot of variance and probably much more variance than our fixed effects. Basically, our fixed effects are not very good for the data. Yeah. Now I will send, I can send these files to you. Here I have the same file, but I included all the possible effect size. I'll show you. How do you calculate the effect size only for the fixed effects? Again, when you only use intercepts and slopes. Okay. Look, remember that I first uh i first fit the random effects model so when i finished fitting all random effects this is what i got this is before adding fixed effects this is our last model after adding fixed effects okay how do i calculate this well basically you sum everything here and you sum everything here so the sum of everything from the left minus the sum of everything from the right divided by the sum of everything from the left. Again, a proportion, but considering all the effects, okay? I've done all the calculation for you here. That's 19.22%. Now, our total, our model had a 45.82% of variance explained. That's our effect size. Our fixed effects, explain 19% of 46%. So the effect size of our model is this, 19% of this 46 is explained by the predictors. 
In other words, the predictors would probably explain about 8% of variance. Actually, do not do this. This is not correct, but well, I have done this before. Is it still there? I have uh, removed, I have removed all the random effects from the model. Um, is it there somewhere? I don't know, it's not. I have removed all the fixed effects from the random effects from the model, put fixed effects only. And if you do that, and you compare the residuals from the empty model at the beginning to the residuals from the model with fixed effect only, this is exactly what you will find, 8.8%. So you can see very clearly that the random effects, let me close this, because the random effects account for much more variance in the model than the fixed effects. You can see clearly, I suppose, how important the random effects are to explain variance, to explain error in our data. And now finally, remember, I've been saying, I've been repeating, we talked about power effects and all that power, uh, the, the power of mixed models, the, the, the minimum number of participants you have to have. I have said before that some people recommend between 30 and 50, some people recommend 40, yes, and we had 18, okay? Now, under the assumption that the model is underpowered, we did at the end, something called bootstrapping. I will sh I'm not, I cannot do that because it takes hours, okay? But it's pretty simple to do in SPSS. You can go to mixed models linear. Just go to bootstrap, perform bootstrapping. Uh, people differ. I would go for at least 5,000. Uh, and we use the bias corrected and accelerated, which corrects for bias and corrects for skewness in the data. Um, it is recommended when the, when the distribution of the data is unknown, when the assumptions failed, normality and homogeneity of errors, for instance, and when you don't have enough data, okay? So we ran this. It actually took uh, two days, I think, running this. Actually, we ended up canceling the 5,000 because it was taking more than a day and we did with 2,000 only, yeah? But then the final result, the final model, you can see only speed line is not significant. Whereas before, you can see the difference here, okay? Now, if we look at the bootstrapped, for example, confidence intervals, they're much narrower, right? So here, the, 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 the increase in speed for clip zero was 11, right? But the, the, the confidence interval says that it could be up to 14, so it could increase much more, yeah? Uh, the difference in clip was seven at the beginning, but it could be even up to nine. And the speed clip interaction, yes, so you have an idea, it could be minus 9.73, which means that the slope for this, instead of being 11 minus five would be 11 minus nine, let's say. So this would increase very little. And that this other one here would increase much more. Yes, so you can see that there is a possibility here uh, for an interaction, you can see that this is, uh, you can see the reason why this would be significant. And I can show you in SPSS. I will run the model again, just to show you this. And I will save, uh, what was that? Okay, predicted values for the fixed effects here, okay? Did you switch off bootstrapping? Oh no, okay, let me, let me, Cancel, okay, I have to, can, thanks. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks, without bootstrapping, yes. Okay, um, good. So save predicted values. Is the model still the same? Yes, random subtitle intercept. Good, good, continue, okay. 
really SPSS. Catastrophic, catastrophic. error. Uh, I think it's a <laughs> good Fantastic. time to finish this now. <laughs> okay, guys. You know, bas basically what I did was I, I wanted the predictive values for participants, and then uh, I would create a line graph like here, but not by clip, by participants, and you would show that the, the lines of participants, they cross very significantly so. Yeah. I could show you that, but SPSS basically got tired or, yeah, bug. And this is the final, uh, the final, um, the, 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 I use the predict values for the residuals of participants. And you can see how different participants have completely different intercepts and completely different slopes. There is even one person here that at 12 CPS has an average PRT of about 52, but then at 20 CPS goes down to about 45. I uh, don't know why, there is another decrease here. Perhaps we could look at these people to see, you know, if they are outliers. Oh, we did it, yeah. So this is it. Uh, does anybody have any questions? 